Welcome, friends. We're just going to give everybody a minute here to get in with us. We are glad you're here this morning. It's good to see everybody. As folks come on in this morning, I was uh, just giving thanks uh, for Jason and Roz and their willingness to be with us over the past four weeks. It has been such a gift. And I said, they're my favorite presenters because of um, how practical they are, how, how truly we can um, take what they're sharing and we can apply it in our local context, wherever you are in that context. So um, whether that's urban or rural, whether it's a mighty church or large church, I call small church mighty church because small churches are mighty, um, wherever you are that, that you can really apply this and um, reach out to your local context and do it in a way that makes sense in that local dive, in that local community. So um, it's been a joy to be with them. And I know that they will return back to EPA for resourcing uh, later this fall and into the new year as we uh, plan more with them. So I'm gonna just take off this sound. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin Babcock. Kevin has been a gift uh, serving with me over these months. He serves now um, just out of the pure love of Jesus in a, in a volunteer capacity here in this conference and and he's such a blessing so kevin is going to lead us in prayer this morning thank you don may we pray dear lord we're thankful for everything uh, that you have created for us this beautiful world these beautiful relationships and friendships that we have formed through your church and through our lives we give you thanks for the gifts of jason and Roz, who are able to translate um your kingdom into a way that's accessible to everyone that we can implement through our own ministries. We give you thanks for our annual conference, which we recently completed. May you continue to bless us, lead us, guide us, protect us, and keep us. Watch over all of us as we learn today. May we make these learnings a part of who we are, that way we bring flavor and the spice of our Lord Jesus Christ into the world each and every day. Through you we pray. Amen. 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 All Thank right. You. Well, Roz, I think uh, we ticked everybody off. Our, our attendance is lower today <laughs> in the last few weeks, but uh, we are, are thrilled to be uh, with you for this last session of uh, Franchise to Local Dive Book Club. Um, and uh, one of the things I would hope that maybe we could leave some time at the end, since we've had four weeks of this, is just some time for conversation or questions or anything that you all would like to ask. But uh, those are some of the things I'd like to say. Roz, you want to you say anything to get us kicked off? Yeah, um, as we kind of have been working our way through the book, um, just kind of important to share, you know, Jason and our relationship is interesting because we've helped each other out as colleagues, but then at times he served, he's has served as my coach in some ways, um, which has been pretty cool. Um, in terms of preaching and teaching and then worship and thinking through that. So as we kind of like go further into this and, and finish up and then kind of leave some room, I just kind of want to preface it by saying as a church planter, I was um, taught, you know, to do splash events and gather people together. But what do you do once you have people gathered together? I didn't know what to do with them. Now, uh, worship was always secondary to me in thinking about that because I was always just thinking, just get them here. As a church planter, you just want warm bodies. But the thoughtfulness behind kind of the ingredient, making it worth the wait and all that um, are some things that Jason taught me. And so looking forward to kind of diving in. Well, and Roz has been uh, like a, a coach to me as well. Like uh, he's my first call. Um, we bounce things off each other all the time. And um, Roz has been doing a lot of a coaching and mentoring for years. So it's a mutual admiration society between us for sure. Um, this last chapter of the book that uh, I hope we can kind of dig deep into is really, it's called Worth the Weight. And it's about kind of the, the essential ingredients that make what we do uh, something worth coming back for. And as Ross said, a lot of times what happens with planters uh, who are starting new, uh, new campuses, new services, all those sorts of things, we're so focused on kind of the minutia of making it all happen 
building the launch team, finding the space, acquiring the equipment, you know, branding and all that, that we don't leave a lot for the actual recipe of, of worship and so on. So um, we thought we'd just kind of walk through some of the lessons in the last chapter. Um, we think there are several uh, key, five and key ingredients that you have to consider, whether you're starting a new campus, whether you're starting a new service, whether you're merging two congregations together and so on. And so those five things uh, that we think are really key to having a recipe that will draw people long-term are worship, uh, guest readiness. So the idea of hospitality, we don't automatically earn the second, third and ongoing visits for folks. Uh, community building, uh, Roz is, uh, has a, a ton of, a wealth of information to share about that. Uh, discipleship, people wanna know what to do next and then mission, and how do we uh, create action-oriented churches where people are not just coming uh, on Sunday to escape the world, but being sent out into that world to do something uh, and make a difference. Um, so I thought maybe we could just jump into this, and Roz, we can kind of jump back and forth here. Um, but, but first, uh, worship is a really essential ingredient in creating something that is, uh, is engaging and palatable Throughout the book, you know, we talk about a lot of different uh, styles of worship and, and opportunities from fresh expressions to messy church, uh, third space type things, all of that. Uh, but there are a few key ingredients even within that particular area that uh, I think it's important we talk about. Uh, first uh, is the environment that we're creating in the worship that we do. Um, what do you want your worship to feel like and, and look like uh, and ambience? The ambience of the room is a really important aspect of whatever you're doing. I see a lot of churches who are doing traditional worship in a cathedral-like sanctuary, try and do non-traditional worship, and the setting, the environment itself, doesn't always, it's not always real conducive to that look and feel and so on. So I would encourage you, if you're trying a new expression of worship, uh, to either find a new space or find a way to transform the space that you're in to make it uh, feel different for that uh, new expression. Um, in the, in the uh, book, um, on page 190, you can see some different um, iterations of that, some examples of what it looks like. Um, music, of course, is really important. I think we may have hit a couple of those things last time we were together. Um, how you set up your, your liturgy, your theme, your creativity is really important as well. And then uh, <clears throat> moving on here, uh, missional application. So what are you going to do to drive people into this idea? Um, I like to think about what is the, the desired outcome or uh, the missional opportunity that's a part of what you're doing. And we get into some of that in the, the book as well. And uh, then um, I think, uh, Roz, do you want to add anything to any of that where worship is concerned, given that you play it out all the time? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, we may not think much about environment, but that is a part of worship, even though we, we say worship space, space is arbitrary, yet space is everything. I mean, think about it, maybe in your church, people are fighting over possibly the carpet or stained glass window. So if space wasn't important, they wouldn't be, you know, fussing about it. However, I want to, I want to just say this, um, be who you are and embrace that. And so um, you don't need a multi-million dollar capital campaign on your facility in order to cook a, uh, a meal that's going to be palatable. Um, so whatever you do, you, you do it for your best for the Lord. Um, but again, it's not spending resources you don't have, but it could be just simple tricks of the trade. Um, you know, one backdrop that we often show is uh, a campus that I pastored. Uh, you know, they were everybody was impressed with, quote unquote, our stage design. When they came to find out looking up close, it was paper plates with some lighting and all that, that cost us a few bucks. So um, just the little things can enhance your space when it comes to worship. Um, so that's just something to think about. Jason's gonna show us kind of some yeah. of these now, some examples. And, you know, it's cool because you could do this with a traditional space. You can, you know, make it more of a multi-purpose so you can have multiple expressions even in that kind of same 
same setting. Uh, so we're attempting to do that. Again, I mentioned the campus that we're adopting. We're going to do a traditional and non-traditional service in the same space, but we're going to make it so the room can kind of, we can flip it pretty easily so it can be somewhat multi-purpose. Now, this is a room with, um, you know, stained glass windows and, and all that, but it's, um, it, it'll be interesting because we'll do tech upgrades as well. So it'll have a lot of the similarities. Um, that's the picture there. Um, that's paper plates. Yeah, so you can see down in the left corner there, um, is that DJ? I think DJ is uh, stapling those to the wall and just some colored light on it. Um, let me uh, let me go. I'm going to escape out of here for just a second. Just a little less polished because I wasn't set up for it. But let me show you a couple of environmental uh, kind of things that um, we'll see if my uh, program cooperates. So this is the church. This is a church that was doing two different expressions of worship. This is their traditional service in this beautiful cathedral like worship space. Uh, but take a look at what they do for their um, non-traditional service. So uh, they turn the lights out, they roll in some TVs, they pull up some backdrops. Uh, they kind of try to minimize that um, cathedral-like space and make it feel a little more non-traditional. They don't have a second space that they can use. Um, here are a couple other examples. This, uh, those, that background back there, this is a church in Bradenton, Florida. Really, really impressive, right? Except when you get up really close, those are just boxes from Uline. They're just white boxes that they ordered and they push some of them back further and some of them are out a little closer and they just shine some colored light on it. This is a friend of mine in California and what they have done is they transformed their space over there on the left. It's what it looked like before. They actually took the pews and they put them on rollers. So they are creating this conversational space that's in the round, but because they have wheels on the pews that lock, they can always reset the room to look the way it did before. So to create a more non-traditional kind of environment, um, that's what they've done. Uh, this is a, this is at Ginghamsburg Church years ago. We did a thing with dominoes uh, using the idea of uh, John 15, as a father loves me, so I love you, remain in my love. And so it's the love of the father into the son, into the disciples, into the early church, into our lives that go beyond that. And so everybody got a domino on the way into worship. And uh, there was a moment where people are invited to reflect on um, what that domino represented, that we have the same, the same Holy Spirit resides in us that, that rolled that stone away from the tomb. And so we are like a domino in God's uh, rally. And so this is a, uh, at the front of the stage, people were invited to bring those dominoes up and put them in the rally as part of a prayer so that we could see together how we are all part of God's movement in the world. So those are a few different environmental uh, kind of pictures that uh, I thought might be helpful for you. Um, let's see, what else? Guest writing. Let's talk, let's talk about guest readiness for just a moment. Uh, this is another one of those things where we oftentimes don't have a lot of attention to give to um, when we're starting something new. We're just trying to get all of our ducks in a row to make the room right. And if we spend any time on anything, it's often worship, but sometimes the hospitality piece of it can really uh, be missing. So one of the, I have a whole training I do called five things your visitors are thinking, but won't ask. And this is uh, some of this material kind of comes from that. And of course, Roz adds uh, his additional thoughts to it as well. But I think one of the key things that we have to think about when it comes to relating to new people is that we have to get away from what I call transactional mentality to a, a relational mentality, which means that when people walk in the door, it's not about handing them a bulletin or a worship folder or a piece of paper. It's really about the conversations you have with them about building meaningful relationships. And I think this is really, uh, our websites are a great way to extend relationship but sometimes we treat our, our our websites like they're transactional. So we'll just list a pastor's name and a phone number. There's no real getting to know them. Uh, we'll have just the times for when we meet for worship. So you heard about some of this in both and if you attended the both and webinar, but every you ought to have a picture of your staff on uh, your, your staff could be a team. It's a volunteer team. Uh, let them see you, let them get to know you ahead of time, a way to contact that person. 
Um, I think one of the most important things is a bio or a, not just a bio, but a, a vision statement for why you're excited about the ministry that you're doing. And then in this last season, I've been talking about even doing like little video vignettes that you might even shoot on your phone uh, because some people are not in your building right now. And so getting to know people ahead of time, uh, anything you'd add there, Roz, about um, guest readiness when it comes to um, making people feel welcome at the, you know, as they come in? Yeah, I, I would say um, having some an outside perspective will be good. Um, and this is where I think um, a lot of times either new churches or existing churches, um, they say they're welcome to new people, but you could tell they're not ready for anybody new to show up. So if I come to your church and I don't know, you have eight entrances, I have no idea where to go. Um, I walk in, nobody greets me. Um, I don't know where the bathroom are. Is there's no clear signage in that? Um, th those things can kind of make a break a visit, um, and we want to be able to retain people as guests. And so I kind of look at it as, you know, a distinguishing visitor versus um, kind of a, a guest in your house is like uh, refrigerator rights. Um, Jason's been a, a good friend of mine now for a while, and so if he comes over. I'm not, I don't care if he goes into my fridge uh, versus somebody I don't know that I'm not really, you know, planning on them coming. They're coming unexpected. That would be weird. And so with a guest, uh, we're expecting them to be there. And a lot of times our churches aren't set up that way. And so with a local dive, think about it. Um, there's an element of hospitality. It might not be flashy. So what we're telling you is to live into who you are but don't be uh, something you're not. And so uh, it, it's thinking strategically. If you have grumpy people, it's common sense not to put them as greeters. <laughs> How, however, that happens more than we think. Um, yeah. And what I tell people is um, if you don't have anything to say when you're greeting, just say, hi, how are you doing? Whatever. Don't, don't carry on a conversation if that's not your gifting, but we encourage people if this isn't your gift or your thing, don't do it. Um, yeah, the funny, it, I've been to a couple churches where uh, the head greeter uh, was the least friendly person in the church. Um, I was at a, a, a church in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, one time doing a secret worshiper consultation. And I was worshiping at their non traditional fir service first and their contemporary service second. And I walked in and I said to the person, they didn't know I was secret worshiping. Uh, walked into the uh, building and said to the greeter, I said, hey, I noticed on your sign outside, you have a, a second service here. Can you tell me about that? And she said, oh, that's the contemporary service. The music's too loud. I don't really enjoy it. You know, whatever. And I'm thinking, my goodness, maybe you shouldn't be the person at the front door. I didn't say that to, to her. Uh, what we say to people, though, really matters. Um, I walked into a church in Waterloo, Iowa, a few years ago as a secret worshiper. And the, when I walked in the door, this lady said, you have a strange face. And I'm like, I do. Oh, my gosh. Like she meant I was a stranger. She's like, I just meant I don't recognize you. And I'm like, oh, well, I'll work on my face. You know, um, uh, here's something you can you can tell your greeters that works every time. Don't ask people, are you new here? Don't say, hey, is this your first time? Say, have we met yet? You can never lose anything by saying, have we met yet? Because it's offensive if I've been coming for six weeks and somebody says, are you new here? Like, gosh, I guess I just didn't make any impression. But you can always uh, say, uh, are, are you new here? Um, one, one more funny, funny thing. I was at a church um, where I learned that the head usher or head greeter, I'm sorry, uh, was very hard of hearing. And so when you walked in the room and you said, good morning, uh, you know, uh, where can I find the children's ministry area? You know, and she looked at me and said, huh? And I said, where can I find the children's ministry area? You know, and she's like, no, we're not having uh, chicken dinner today, you know, or whatever. Like she couldn't really hear what I was saying. And I said, um, that person can be super friendly, but maybe not the best first impression at the front door. So introverts, you know, people maybe who don't hear well, uh, people who are not real comfortable with um, making conversation in a moment's notice, uh, you have to strategically pick these folks. So, uh, Roz, you just reminded me of, of some great stories there. 
Um, another thing I think we have to be careful about is uh, what I call unspoken rituals. Um, every church has rituals. Uh, every church has their practices and your people all know because they've been indoctrinated, they've been coming for a while, exactly what to do and when to do it. And they'll engage without any uh, real prompting. You know, many of us know in our traditional United Methodist churches that uh, in, in some of them, uh, when it's time to take the offering, the doxology begins to play and we sing it on key, well, hopefully on key, uh, without a hymnal in front of us and no words on the screen. Um, but, but an outsider doesn't know anything about any of that. I was at a church in uh, Denver a few years ago and somebody handed me a basket about a minute into the worship service. And I was like, they are, they surely they're not taking the offering already. I thought, what is this? And I kept staring at it and I didn't know what to do with it. And finally, some person behind me had pity on me and leaned up and they said, that's for if you have any prayer requests. And I was like, oh, thank you. And then I thought, well, I guess I'll just will them into the basket because I didn't have a pencil or paper to put them in there. And I passed the basket on and for like the next five minutes, I didn't hear anything the pastor said because I was distraught by this moment where I'm like, I don't know what just happened. Uh, and then after worship, I talked to the pastor. He said, well, everybody knows that we do. I said, you can't say everybody knows because I'm new here and I don't know. So rituals are not a bad thing, but we have to give a spoken word to them. Roz, anything you want to expand on that or, or add? Uh, you know, I, I, I just can't, you know, emphasize that enough, um, even what we do within the service in terms of it makes sense to us, communion and, you know, baptism, and maybe even when we're teaching scripture, but, you know, we have the task of trying to meet people on their level, and so when we go back to our metaphor uh, with this local dive and with Ezra, he was out there preaching the word for eight hours, and then there were those that were helping to translate the message to make it readable. And so really our job is cultural architects in terms of translating the gospel um, in today's vernacular. And so we do that through all kinds of medium and modes. Um, our space tells the story, our language, everything else in between. And so uh, think about what you, uh, what the impression that you're making in this local dive. So some of the greatest local dives do not have multi-million dollar facilities. Just like you don't need a multi-million dollar budget to live stream your services for worship. And Jason knows a little bit about that. I tell people to start somewhere. Um, if they're not doing it, start somewhere. It's kind of going back to God talking to Moses and saying, what's in your hand? Uh, don't tell me about what you don't have. Um, you know, us pastors, we can just sing, woe is me. I don't have this. I don't have that. What do you have and kind of build there? Think big, start small. Yeah, good. Um, I also think it's critical that we think about in this both and world, how do we do hospitality online? So that chat experience, when people come in, when you say words that people don't know, you might even consider putting a definition. In. If you're going to say sacrament, are you going to say Eucharist or whatever? Uh, you might even in, uh, consider having some of those definitions prepared that you'd throw in the chat or that you might explain. Um, I don't think I've told this story before to this group, uh, but years ago I was secret worshiping at a church in Las Vegas and the pastor was standing up in front of the crowd and he told me at the beginning, he's like, help me. If I say anything I shouldn't say, just let me know as, as an outsider. I said, oh, I, I certainly will. And he said, uh, you all know about the power of the Holy Eucharist, right? And I was sitting there and I watched this lady sitting in front of me turn to her daughter. Her daughter looked to me to be about 10 or 11 years old. Uh, you all know about the power of the Holy Eucharist, right? And the lady turned to her daughter and she said, nope. And I laughed, uh, chuckled a little bit. But then when the daughter turned back to the mother, she said, you don't know about the Holy Uterus? And she said, uterus, like the female anatomy. And I almost fell out of my chair when I heard this. And I thought, boy, something was lost in translation there. And after worship, I said to the pastor, I said, I got an anatomy lesson in worship today. He's like, what, what did you hear? And I told him and he's like, oh my gosh, I guess I should have said uh, Holy Communion. And I said, you think? <laughs> but even communion is a word that outsiders might not know. So 
it, it's, it's okay to have our insider words, but we have to walk people into those things as well. Uh, so watching our insider language is also a really important aspect of creating an environment that is comfortable and safe. Um, I often ask, uh, uh, what is that big room outside the sanctuary? Uh, some of us uh, know right off the bat what I'm talking about. We call it the narthex, right? The narthex sounds contractible. Like, I, that's a scary word. I feel like I need a hazmat suit to walk into a room called a narthex. Um, our language, even in our signage and the way that we do things in the building for an outsider may feel very uncomfortable. I think our non-denominational brothers and sisters get this right in a way that we often don't. They, they call the sanctuary, I know this is like a really uncomfortable word for some of us, but they call it the auditorium. Like outside of the church, the sanctuary is just a place that birds fly around, right? We don't, we don't know what a sanctuary is. Or, or we hand out that piece of paper we call the bulletin. The only time I hear the word bulletin is when the police are looking for someone. Uh, you know, maybe they're looking for them at your church. Um, and, and we, you know, the benediction, that's that guy that like betrayed the, the <laughs> United States, you know, like, what are these words, right? Uh, so uh, we've got to be careful about our language and help people to engage with them. So uh, hospitality and, is, is important. Go ahead. And J Jason, I I'll just use them as teaching moments. I never shy away from any of that. So I do a benediction at the end of every service. I'm say, and I say, hey, um, right now we're going to prepare our hearts to receive what we call the benediction, and then I explain it. It, it all it is one transitional sentence, um, because the hope is you're expecting at least one new person to show up. Praise God if it is, or maybe it's folks that have been coming every single Sunday, but they don't know the things that you do and why they mean what they mean. Absolutely, and as you're doing both and worship, if you're doing worship online, you don't know how many guests or visitors you have. You have people that are tuning in that you can't even identify as a visitor. I mean, in the room, you can kind of look out and say, okay, there's some people I don't recognize. So I probably need to say this a little different than I might otherwise. But if you're doing worship online now, you can't even see them. So uh, Roz said something earlier that's really important, and that is that we have to be ready for visitors, or I always say we have to be poised for visitors before they arrive. We can't wait for them to show up and then come up with the plan. So introducing yourself, uh, introducing your customs, your practices, your rituals, all of those things are so important. If you want to create a recipe that people want to continue to, to dine on long term, uh, so worship, I always think of uh, guest readiness as sort of like going to a restaurant. Um, you have the meal and then you have the service around the meal. And if the food is good, but the service is terrible, you may decide not to go back. Even if the food was okay, if the waiter, uh, if the waiter or waitress was not very nice to you, uh, if it took forever to get seated, if they brought the wrong food out, if your drinks weren't refilled, you may say, this was great food but I'm never coming back here because the, the uh, wait staff was not very good. But I think the opposite may be actually, um, people might come back if you have really excellent hospitality and not yeah. as good of food. Like, yeah, they'll say, overlook oh, stuff. Yeah, they'll overlook yeah. things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, go, go ahead, Roz, if you're gonna uh, say this is kind of This is kind of in my thought pattern. I just wanna share this. Um, you know, I worked at United Theological Seminary as well, and, um, you know, we're a growing school, but we've had a low endowment, okay, and part of that was because we are an old EUB school where they didn't really believe in endowments, and some of you kind of know that. Uh, they just take up offerings and send people to school, and uh, we've had people, uh, we've had students um, transfer over to us even as they were getting a full scholarship somewhere else coming to United without a full scholarship because we can't afford to do that. So what can we do that is gonna make up for that experience as we on-ramp? And I hate just saying, um, I hate using this analogy, uh, don't take it the wrong way, but the Disney experience, um, it, it's kind of showing that personalized, people are special, people matter. Um, you know, with Disney, they say, they know that at least 70% of the people that come are gonna return again. And it's based on that experience. And I'm not saying and, we have, go ahead, dude. I just want to add, uh, and I'll uh, let you pick back up on that thought, but it's even in their language. They say, be our guest. 
put our magic to the test, right? They call you. When you go to Disney, you are not a patron. You're not a customer. You are a guest. That's the language they use for the people that are there. Um, and, and what we have to shift in the church is to get away from the idea of visitors. Visitors are unexpected. Guests are prepared for. They're, we're poised for them. Go ahead, Refrig Roz, just one. Refrigerator privileges, you know? Yes. Jason comes over, boom. Um, and and but, last time I was there, I ate all of his caviar. He was not happy about it, but... Um, and, and drink all my champagne. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but what can we make up? So I, I was thinking, I'm like, all right, at our school, we need to make sure we have the best application process that's not weighed down, that will be easy for prospective students to navigate, to make up for that. What can we do in follow-up calls? How can we on-ramp people and roll out the red carpet hospitality-wise? So I can't, I can't give you a full scholarship, but I'm going to care for you because you're important. And what if our local churches had that mindset? Hey, we're going to care for you. We might not have a cafe and uh, a kid's play zone you know, with uh, a playground equipment in our facility, but what can we do? What can we be known for? And that's what local dives have ended up tapping into. Absolutely. Um, another aspect of guest readiness, I think we have to be concerned with, um, especially as we get closer to a more normal experience where we're back in the building again, um, is to avoid what I call forced interaction. Actually, I should say what my wife calls forced interaction. She's an introvert. And her least favorite thing to do in worship is turn to her neighbor and say, or uh, shake the hand of three people around you or whatever. Uh, when we would go to church prior to the pandemic, her favorite thing about COVID, I think, is that she doesn't have to greet people in worship. And my wife is extremely friendly. She's just a little bit introverted. So for her, that's taxing. For me, the difference between she and I, like actually Friday night, I'm headed over to Roz's house. Um, they are uh, celebrating, he and his wife are celebrating their birthday and they're having a little get together. Uh, the difference between my wife and I is at the end of the night, I will say, she'll say, okay, I've talked to three people. Can we go now? And I'll say, wait, there are three people I haven't talked to yet. We can't leave uh, because I'm like uh, an extrovert um, and I make her sound worse than she is. But um, be careful about when people come to your building. Uh, there is no win if I bring a guest with me for the very first time to church and you say, turn to your neighbor and say, uh, we serve an awesome God. Now, I believe that, but my neighbor who I brought from across the street who does not believe in God, if I finally convince him to come to church and you say, turn to your neighbor and say, we serve an awesome God, well, he's in a no-win situation now. He has to either turn to somebody and say, we serve an awesome God, or he's got to sit there and stare forward when people are turning to him on either side, and it would be very uncomfortable. Uh, now, I think less vulnerable things like name your favorite pizza topping, tell your favorite, your neighbor, your favorite pizza topping is a less, if that's somehow factored into your sermon, um, is a less vulnerable thing to do, but be careful. And then if we ever get back to the practice of the greeting time or the passing of the peace, I want you to consider four groups of people that we don't often think about during that time and, and to give them an opportunity to kind of bow out. The first is introverts. Um, I, like I said, I married an introvert. I love introverts. Um, those who are averse to touch, you know, there are some people that have a negative history of touch in their lives. Uh, they don't necessarily want to be hugged. Uh, they, they may, my son has something called sensory processing disorder. I'm lucky if he'll give me a five minute hug. Um, you've got those germaphobes. Uh, I think in the last year, we've all been germaphobes. Uh, but uh, when we get back, to our in-person gatherings. If we start to do that, remember that during cold and flu season, some people do not want to shake hands. Uh, and the thing is, is we don't give them an out. I'll, I'll say one more thing about that. Um, and then finally, those with uh, uh, immune compromised, um, you know, immunocompromised systems, uh, people who are on chemotherapy and things like that. I had one church tell me, one pastor tell me, I tried to cut the, um, the passing of the peace and my people revolted and the reason I tried to cut it is that we had uh, an elderly person in our congregation who had been receiving chemotherapy treatments and felt like he couldn't come to church because even though we had told folks not to sh shake Joe's hand, they would still do it over and over and over again. 
And so he had to stop coming to church and they chose that over. Let's not, let's, let's just greet one another with words rather than uh, touching each other. So that's a practice we're going to have to decide, but here, here are two quick options. Uh, first thing is you might let them bow out. If you're new to a church, you're not ready to work the room and shake hands and hug and all that. So you might say during this time, we're going to uh, greet one another or pass the peace. And if that would be uncomfortable for you, I'm going to invite you to just bow your head right there in your seat and have a little prayer time with one on one on one with God. And we will honor your posture in that moment. What you're really doing is you're telling everybody, Hey, leave that person alone uh, so that they don't have to be forced into this moment. And then the other thing is you might uh, impose limits. You might say, you know, shake a few hands or every other road, turn around and greet the people behind you. Sometimes that greeting time becomes a free for all and it takes 10 or 15 minutes to get back to worship. Some of you, I can tell by your reactions, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and the last thing, uh, and then uh, I'll shut up and I'll let Ross talk some more, um, is uh, that um, you might move it to the end. That pastor that I told you about that, that had the anatomy lesson happen at his church, he said that I decided to move it at the end and make it optional. So I started to tell people, uh, our final uh, act of worship today is going to be passing the peace. That's offering words of peace and greeting one another in the name of Christ. But if that would be uncomfortable for you, then um, I'm going to invite you, if you'd like, you can slip out during what we do right before that, which is called the benediction. And that's a blessing that I'm going to send you into the week uh, for. So feel free to slip out if you want during that time. Or if you'd love to pass the peace, you can pass as much peace as you'd like as we uh, have a fellowship hour afterwards and we'll pass peace around donuts and coffee and those sorts of things. So let me offer the benediction. And he said, I would begin the benediction and I would notice new newcomers would slip out during that time. And he said, I would see a pattern where maybe the first two or three times they'd leave when I did the benediction. And then maybe the fourth time they'd stick around and they talk to folks and the fifth time they do that maybe or sixth time. And then maybe like, seven weeks in, they'd start coming to the fellowship hour. We started easing people into our community rather than forcing them on day one to like hug us and shake our hands and greet us and do things that might be comfortable, uncomfortable for those four groups of people. Uh, I do recognize that some of you are looking at me just thinking, I don't understand any of this, Jason. Why would somebody not like the greeting time? Uh, I'm an extrovert. I like it. But, but those uh, who don't, uh, uh, <laughs> Marla, you are with me. I saw a thumbs down there. Um, uh, uh, last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll open it back up here for Ross. Um, in these five things your visitors are thinking but won't ask webinar or seminars that I do, I do a webinar version of it too, but prior to the pandemic, I was doing them in person. And I would ask people, everybody closed their eyes and I was the only one with my eyes open. And I'd ask people, how many of you are uncomfortable with that time? And just inevitably, every group I talked to, it was about 80% of the hands went up when I asked how many of you are uncomfortable with that time. And then the other 20% couldn't even fathom that that was uncomfortable. But these were leaders. And if that's true for leaders, it's probably pretty true for our congregations as well. So as you go back in person, remember that part of hospitality is not forcing people to be your best buddy on the day they show up. All right, Roz, I'm done. I'm off my soapbox. Um, no, that was all good stuff. I'm going to hit Greg's. Uh, he said, you know, COVID was the perfect time to kill that. So, you know, with, with COVID, it's given us an opportunity to reset. Um, there are some things that are here to stay, like hand sanitizer, providing that. That's something that's probably going to stick around, I imagine. Um, even um, people, you know, as controversial as that is, some of our folks are going to continue to wear masks. And we want to create an environment for folks uh, for the masked and unmasked, okay? Um, so, so being able to, to create that kind of environment, um, and I shared a little bit with my congregation, even though 70% um, still in our congregation all wore masks on Sunday, which is cool. I'm going to wear a mask for the time being just to kind of model that because the youngest of our young um, haven't been given the option to be vaccinated, all that. So our kids are wearing masks and our kids servants are wearing masks as well. Um, you know, so it kind of gives you an opportunity to reset. Uh, one of the things we're looking at, um, the, the building I'm in right now is a traditional, not a tradition, they have more traditional services than non-traditional. It, it's an older uh, congregation, but a flagship church. Uh, it's kind of the mother church that I'm 
helping serve. And one of the things that I encouraged them to do was go from a 20 page bulletin down to either a one page bulletin or digital. And you know, that's a sacred cow, but with COVID it allowed a reset. They spend $12,000 a year on printing material for bulletins. Now imagine what that could do in terms of missional impact. So COVID has given them permission to reimagine and rethink that. So use that, um, use this to your advantage. Uh, what's fruitful in making disciples and what's not? And if it's not, then it needs to, you know, anything that's not bearing fruit can be cut or pruned or reimagined. Um, and so it's something to just think about. But Don asked a question that was a great one. Um, bringing people on your campus. Um, you know, last week, I'll give you an example in the life of Mosaic where I serve. Um, we had the Chamber of Commerce come and uh, they wanted to use our space. And guess who was the speaker? Me. Um, and so there I have a hundred business leaders in our space and on etched on one of the walls, it says, welcome home. And our space is your space. And so automatically I look at it as a victory. I've always looked at buildings are a tool in God's toolbox. I use it as a victory anytime someone walks through our doors. And so now the mall walkers, guess what? Um, if they, they can walk through our space, we open the doors, they can extend their laps, they sign in. And at the end of the year, they're gonna get a $50 gift card for a new pair of sneakers. Um, again, last week we had the COVID clinic in, and so they were distributing COVID vaccines in our facility. How much did that cost us? Nothing. But how many people came through our doors? We greeted with hospitality, tremendous amount. And we, we've done that even in traditional spaces that I've had. Um, oh, you're a social worker and you're looking for office space. Well, if I trust you and I kind of date you a little bit, then, and, and kind of feel, yeah, because not every opportunity is something you need to say yes to. It needs to align your vision and mission and values. So you don't just let any group in and you don't want to uh, book yourself out of ministry. What I mean by that is um, don't reserve spaces for all the community events and then your church isn't doing anything, but dovetail and piggyback, it, it's, partnering. So bringing folks onto the campus is not always something, an event that you're going to create and do, but it's going to be also partnering and networking as well. And there's so many different ways to do that, but look at it as extending hospitality. Uh, you know, that's what drives me nuts with churches, with preschools, where the preschool is so disconnected from the church when it should be a mission out of the church. And you have the, you know, you might need the right personnel in there where you're sharing the Christmas story or you're coming in and blessing families and are able to build those relationships. So it's not segmented or just a money maker. It's the ministry of the church. Absolutely. Good, good stuff. Um, a couple of other uh, aspects of creating a winning recipe that we want to touch on uh, are creating a discipleship pathway. You know, people will eventually get bored with just doing worship and showing up and, and not really being connected fully into your church. So Roz, you want to talk a little bit about what you've done uh, with discipleship pathway at Mosaic and other places you've been? Yeah. Um, you know, this is not my gifting. So I want to just say it first and foremost, I'm more ape apostle prophet evangelist. And so um, I usually love them and leave them. What I mean by that is I'll, I'll bring them in, I'll greet them, they'll like me, but then I want to pass them off. I want to get them assimilated into the life rhythm of the church. And so, you know, Rick Warren had the old baseball diamond and we're familiar with that, Saddleback Sam. And he, you know, you got 101, 201, 301, 401, membership, all that. Uh, some people will call you the, their pastor without ever setting foot in your congregation or church. They may even give toward your food bank. And they may be the first one to, to write a check. Um, so everybody's on a different journey. But with discipleship particularly, I don't want to be told 
what class I got to take when. Um, I don't work like that. Just like I buy books, but I'm probably not going to read all, every page word for word. I'm going to get out of it what I want to get out of it and kind of put it down. And then I'll probably go back to it at another point. Um, I think a lot of people think of discipleship as more, these are your strategic next steps. But what if it looked, we at Mosaic imagined it like a passport. And, um, you know, we, we would stamp people as they went through the different classes and trying to, to honor that. And so um, it, it is about relationship, Kevin. Absolutely. So that's the passport that we created. And it has our vision, mission, and values. And then different ways to connect in the ministries. Um, and it's not, oh, you got to take this class. There's no prerequisite. But we want people to make their way around. Um, I mentioned last time, Alpha is one of our staples that we do. Another is kind of a more of a finance-related class with stewardship. Another that we've been offering is spiritual gifts. Another is kind of membership and on-ramping that. And I'll say this with membership. Um, we've had people join our church that don't live in the same city. They joined online. When Last time we did members, uh, we had more people online became members than in person. But they went through and did all the requirements and um, you know, prayers, presence, gifts, service. But we broke it down and we put it all online for people. And then we did Zoom. Um, but the lessons and the modules were all online. Um, so that that's kind of a part of that diet that we have, uh, that healthy balance. And then we have uh, multi-ethnic conversations. So how do we um, work, worship, and live together um, in these times today uh, where we want to reflect and model heaven? And we know one of the most segregated hours in America is still 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So how does the church reflect what heaven already looks like and what's a God reality? Um, and so those are a part of our rhythms, but people can kind of choose when they want to do what. And uh, that passport is just kind of created our, what we call a discipleship pathway. That's all it is. The last two ingredients uh, that uh, we don't really have time to fully unpack and explore here are to think about community building. Um, you heard uh, some of that in our earlier conversations, but getting out of the community, making meaningful relationships, uh, partnering with schools, you know, police ride-alongs, all the things that Roz has talked about. And then also, um, how can we be a missional presence in our communities? Um, again, people don't wanna just passively sit and listen and worship. They wanna actively participate uh, and, and really, I just steal this from Roz because he's always said people want to, do, want to know what to do next. They don't want to just sit in, in a stagnant sort of relationship. But what do we do next to really kind of move things forward? Uh, we've got about 12 minutes left officially. So I wonder if we might just open it up uh, to some questions and reflections and things like that. I will uh, point out to you that the last chapter of the book is um, all about the to-go box, the next steps. What do you do to really implement? And um, we encourage you to think about one thing that you're going to do after reading the book and not 10 things, but one thing you're really going to commit to. Um, we would encourage you to write a purpose or vision statement for what it is you're going to do. Start a new thing, revitalize an old thing, whatever, to start your plan. It doesn't have to be perfect. As, as Ross says, just get started. And then to iterate, uh, get better, as, as you go, you don't have to do it perfect. Don't let, don't let the pursuit of perfection pause you beginning what you're doing. So let's, uh, let's open it up to some conversations, some questions. This is our last of four gatherings. So we wanna have an opportunity to chat. Don't everybody ask at once. Any comments or questions or reflections I see a okay. question from Barbara in the chat, Jason. All right. Yeah, I would, let me go with this. And then Jason, you probably have more on it, but I would say there's probably data out there. It probably matters what region of the country you're in. I would say um, that's going to determine a lot in what tradition you're from. Um, you know, I know um, 
my brothers and sisters in African American churches, uh, their services um, are a later time usually. Um, and so it's nothing for them to have a noon service or twelve thirty service. Um, in other congregations, it's a bit different. Um, in our setting here, probably you don't want to go past eleven in doing a worship service uh, start time anyway. So I do any I try to do anything before eleven and nothing before nine a.m. So that gives you a kind of a smaller window. Um, and I want to challenge you. If you're thinking about maybe starting a new worship experience, always also think about um, besides Sunday mornings. Um, you know, one of the things that is growing right now trend wise is a Thursday night worship. I've seen Friday night celebrate recovery type stuff, even Monday night worships and even uh, Sunday nights are coming back as well. Um, and so. It, it regionalization, I think, makes a difference with context. But Jason, go for it. No, I think you're that's all sound solid advice. I think uh, somewhere between the nine and 11 o'clock hour are, are kind of the sweet spot. I see a lot of worship that's there. I also think that we have to consider, and I said this to you if you were part of both and um, creating sort of an evergreen experience as well. We have to consider that people. Uh, are now tuning in to worship on their own terms when it makes sense for them to be a part of it. So watching your language, giving them a recap, um, giving context to whatever's happening the day that you're talking about it. We can speak in very vague terms sometimes about, you know how important tomorrow is. Tomorrow is such a big day. So as you move through tomorrow, just remember the struggles that tomorrow represents. Well, if I'm watching this six months later, what are you talking about? Was tomorrow 9-11 or was tomorrow... Martin Luther King Day, or, you know, that's what I'm, that's what's in my head, but uh, give context uh, for posterity's sake, capture what's been happening on the day that you're doing it. We, ha I think we have to think with the future in mind, even as we do Sunday and not just be rooted only in that moment, but think about the fact that now that we're online, uh, people can engage at a later time. There's a comment in the chat, uh, Jason and Roz from Maria about changing mindsets of people who have been there for a long time. And I just wonder if you could comment on that. Sometimes I say to people, you're not gonna change those mindsets. You need to offer them whatever it is they love, but then you need to build something new. I just, I'm just curious of your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, church, go, go ahead, ahead Jason. You uh, go church, church within a church. So um, if you have that, you know, that group that wants their 830 traditional worship in the small venue, you, you give them that probably knowing that it's not going to grow and they don't want to change. You're almost kind of, um, you know, you're encouraging them, you're loving them. I don't want to use the word hospice chaplain or anything like that, but you're, you're kind of a chaplain to that group. But at the same time, if you can find those people whose hearts are strangely warmed and they're wanting to do something new, but I, here's what I find. Some of the, the older folks I've encountered, they're all about change. I think a lot of it has to do with personality. Um, and usually the younger people don't like change, uh, what I see. Now, a lot of it's new church culture versus um, inherited church, but I think that church within a church model is huge. Um, you know, and so it might mean giving the people what they want, but then starting something simultaneously with um, new as well and helping to kind of show them this is why we're doing it and um, allowing that opportunity. I would also add that I think we greatly underestimate the value of vision casting. Uh, sometimes we just go about our ministry and we have an idea as a leader of what we want to accomplish, but we don't ever help the people see that vision that we have and, and why we're doing it. I will take you back to the first week when we showed that Michael Jr. clip where he talked about knowing your why. Your what is doing church, but your why drives why, what, how you're going to do church. And I think too often we don't help people see the why and, and people rise up and resist what they don't understand. Wait a minute. This feels like an arbitrary decision. Why are you doing this? And if we don't take the time uh, to, to help them understand the why, 
I, I found in my ministry, both as a coach and uh, as a member of different worship design teams and so on, um, that when you can kind of help people understand, like, this is the thinking behind this, most of the time people will actually come along with you. Some people will resist no matter what. Um, we're in a kind of an odd situation where the church that Roz has inherited, adopted, um, I did some coaching with prior to Roz working with this church. And it was my job to go in and be this change agent and help them uh, revitalize their worship experience. And uh, I had some folks in the early days of those conversations who were very resistant to what I was bringing to the table. But the more time we spent together, the more I helped them uh, know why, see, see why, and then even to kind of write a purpose statement of who are you trying to reach. And uh, I had to keep reminding them that if you tell me you want to reach these people, you have to do things in a different way. We can't do the same thing and expect different results. We have to do something different if we want different results. And what have the results been for the last few years? Decline, right? So we have to do new things. Uh, and when I when they could see the why, there was a, a much greater desire to be a part of it. Some of them are, are going to, no matter what, they're going to fight you. But um, I think we have to vision cast more than we often do. Let's see, what else? Our church moved uh, 1030, contemporary back to 830 and traditional to 11 a.m. with 9.45 Sundays. So let's let's do that Saturday night one first, Ruth. Oh, sorry, it, I missed it, that. It's okay. Um, I have mixed feelings, so probably not the best one to give counsel on this, but um, usually the shelf life, from what I've researched and seen, being a part of two different Saturday night worships at different venues is the shelf life is not long. Um uh, a large percentage, I can't recall, end up kind of discontinuing after about three to five years. Um, Saturday nights wear on your servants and your staff. And, I'll, and a lot of it's going to be contextual too. And so some may, in re different regions, may work well. But if you're in a major college football area, um, that's not going to work. But maybe if you're in a Catholic area that people are already kind of accustomed to come in on Saturday nights. Contextually, it didn't work for me at the point because I was in a large African-American community. I inherited a Saturday night service, but people thought we were a different religion because we had church on Saturdays. They didn't understand it. So I think context matters, but I think also the wear and tear and um, be kind to yourself. Um, gosh, it, it, it's just a bear. I, I would also add that now that we have the ability with online worship, we can we can premiere a service on Saturday night if we wanted to and allow people to engage that way uh, rather than putting uh, all the effort in it. I mean, there's still effort that goes into it, but you can premiere something. Uh, now, the church I go to, they do a Saturday night service. I've never been to it. Um, it's It's never been... Uh, for, for me, uh, maybe I'm, I'm still just old school traditional Sunday morning is when you go to church. And I think that's what a lot of people, uh, feel. So, um, you know, uh, you, you just have to measure along the way is, is the juice worth the squeeze as one of my friends often says, um, as far as the question about moving the contemporary back, I am not a fan of earlier contemporary worship. I think most people that want to attend contemporary are people who are less traditional who don't get up as early and uh and the earlier we make our contemporary i think the more harmful it is to to the groups that uh would typically be drawn to that kind of worship uh, that's been my experience with almost every church that i've coached and worked with that tried to take their contemporary to an earlier hour uh, people who are used to sort of getting up and doing the traditional thing get up on sunday morning wear their sunday's best you know that's sort of the thing uh, especially uh, those who like a really traditional like eight o'clock service or 830 with communion and all that. But typically people who are more contemporary or non-traditional in their lifestyle who are drawn to that uh, don't want to get up, you know, super early on a Sunday morning. And uh, so I would advise you to make your contemporary time later than earlier. But those those are my thoughts. Maybe Roz, you have different thoughts on that. Well, as a parent of young children, um, and many of my friends that are in a similar life stage, man, um, we want contemporary 
but getting kids to church is a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> yep. And um, even as the pastor. Um, and so if we had to do it at 830, it would be impossible. Um, so I would almost flip flop those like that. That would be my I, I'm even seeing it now. We have a 915 and 1045. Um, and the 915, we always have lower kid numbers. And the 1045 is just exploding. And I, I really think it's parents, um, they're running hard during the week. They might want to sleep in just a tad bit, even though their kids are getting up and going crazy probably, but they they don't want to rush out of the house and getting babies and toddlers ready, especially toddlers, is not an easy thing. So uh, keep that in mind in your planning. Um, because oftentimes it's it's younger families who are going to go to a contemporary service versus a traditional service. And, and that's not always the rule, but your traditional folks are more likely to not have young kids and, and to not have to wrestle with all those things. I've got a 12 year old and a 15 year old, and it's hard to get out of the house. Um, our church does worship at nine 30 and that's the only hour that they offer children's stuff. They have an 11 o'clock service that would probably suit our family a whole lot better, but they don't have anything for kids during that hour. So every week we lament having to try and get up and it's 20 minutes away. So lament getting up and getting everybody out of the house and ready to go and all those sorts of things. I wish their 11 o'clock had a children's ministry thing as well. Uh, all right, Don. Well, I think uh, we're over a little bit. We'll, uh, we'll make sure you have the last word there and we're just grateful for the opportunity to be with you. We would give you as many minutes as you want, but we want to respect your time. Jason and Roz, you've been a gift. I did see one last comment from Becky in the chat. And Becky, um, it's a lot of what works in, in your context as well. And I think touch points during the week uh, because people are more and more, you know, have weekends that are full. So how can we make a touch point, whether if that's even a text message to those families during the week to say, hey, how can I pray for you this week, right? What are the ways we can engage? But Jason and Roz, thank you for this. Book club friends, next month we have AJ Levine coming uh, for the month of June. I hope you'll check that out. That's the Bible with and without Jesus. And then in August and September, we have David Wolverton's newest release. And David, AJ will be leading us uh, for the book club next month. And then David Wolverton will be leading us on his book that's hot off the press on how to lead through church conflict. I know you don't have any conflict in your churches, um, but I hope you'll check out that one, which will be coming up later in the summer. So Jason and Roz, this has been uh, such a blessing. Thank you. We wish you God's abundant blessing in your ministry. We look forward to having you back. So so God bless you, friends. Have a great day. Dawn, thank, thank you. you. Thank You're... you so much. We appreciate you. And Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless thank you, friends. You. Bye. Thank you.